There are several books in the Bible that have been removed. Hello. My name is Serge's Mike, and welcome to The Shining. The Greek word apocrypha, which refers to all the texts that were removed from the Bible, literally translates to, those that are hidden, and is used to describe these books. These novels may not have been included for a variety of reasons. Well, prepare yourself because we will dive deeply into the Apocrypha in this video to discover why these books were removed and what this can reveal about the ancient text. What caused these books to be taken out is hidden in sacred mystery. Nobody is exactly sure why this is the subject of so many conspiracy theories and ideas. Others think that they simply didn't fit the story that the old text was attempting to tell. That is not to argue that the books that were eliminated were untrue or wrong, rather, it is to suggest that the information in them wasn't appropriate to the Bible and didn't fit with its overall storyline. What are the 14 books in the Bible and why were they removed? 1. The Gospel of Nicodemus, Acts of Pilate. An alleged gospel from the early church is known as the Gospel of Nicodemus, also known as the Acts of Pilate. The book was not authored by Nicodemus, the Pharisee who appears in the Gospel of John but is titled after him. The book is essentially a compilation of many manuscripts that were probably collected gradually over time. Apocryphal Gospel known as the Book of Nicodemus was well liked during the Middle Ages. It is sometimes referred to as the Acts of Pilate and is said to be a record of Jesus Christ's trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. The Acts of Pilate, the first section of the Gospel of Nicodemus, covers the Passion of Jesus, the second section covers the purported descent of Jesus into hell following his death. There is simply no evidence to support the Gospel of Nicodemus' authenticity. Before the 4th century, at least 300 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the book cannot be dated. Major early Christian authors like Irenaeus and Eusebius do not make any mention to the Gospel of Nicodemus. Additionally, the book asserts a number of events that are not supported by the Bible, including Pilate's conversion to Christianity. Lucius and Carinus are not mentioned by name in the Bible. It is far too late for Nicodemus, Pilate, or any other alleged author to have written the Gospel of Nicodemus, which appears to have been written after the final draft of the Bible. Smash that like button right here and subscribe to the channel for we still have a long and interesting way to go. You will become part of the Shining family if you do so. Back to our topic. 2. The Protoevangelion. The Proto-Evangelium of James is a pseudepigraphal text sometimes known as the Book of James, the Gospel of James, or the Infancy Gospel of James, not to be confused with the New Testament Epistle of James. The title of the work is, The Birth of Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and Very Glorious Mother of Jesus Christ. The word, Proto-Evangelium, refers to the Proto-Gospel, or, Precursor to the Gospel, which in this context refers to Mary's life story. James, the founder of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the New Testament epistle of James, is credited with writing the Proto-Evangelium of James. James is typically referred to as Jesus' half-brother, but this work suggests that he is actually Jesus' stepbrother. The James Proto-Evangelium asserts to provide further information regarding Mary's birth and upbringing as well as the birth of Jesus. According to scholarly views, the Proto-Evangelium of James was not written by Jesus' half-brother or stepbrother, as this work would contend, and was instead composed in the middle of the second century. The Proto-Evangelium of James was neglected by the church because it is pseudepigraphal, written by someone pretending to be someone else. In the third century, Origen describes it as having questionable origins. Over the years, church councils, officials, and even the Catholic Church, which upholds Mary's perpetual virginity, have all condemned the work. Though it is only natural to be interested in the specifics of Jesus, and Mary's, upbringing, the New Testament contains all the information we require. While some imaginative speculation can be allowed, it is improper to offer the theory as fact, which is what the Proto-Evangelium of James's author seems to have done. 3. The Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ. A minor collection of texts known as the Infancy Gospels makes the claim to have information concerning Jesus' early life. Little is known about Jesus' life before he began his public ministry, according to inspired scripture. The Infancy Gospels, on the other hand, tell in-death tales of a preteen Jesus and his household. The James Protoevangelium and Thomas's Infancy Gospel were two well-known gospels. Others can only be discovered in several languages and in pieces. Even both of the main Infancy Gospels were composed far too late to be taken officially. They also have content that is obviously untrue. Both factual errors about the city of Jerusalem and doctrines that are in conflict with the inspired Gospels of Matthew, Mark, 
Luke, and John fall under this category. These infancy gospels spiritual substance is mostly in line with Gnosticism, an early doctrine that plagued the Christian church. These obvious shortcomings prevented such works from being taken into account for the Bible's canon. The four canonical gospels are well known to the majority of people. There were, however, other accounts of Jesus that were told in the early church as well as ones that were written much later. Some of these have only recently come to light. The early church rejected these writings as inspired scripture. While some may have been slightly accurate or useful, they lacked inspiration. The infancy gospel of Thomas falls into the latter category, while others were neither accurate nor useful. 4. The, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas It's important not to mix this book with the recently popular Gospel of Thomas. The Infancy Gospel, not what is currently known as the Gospel of Thomas, is what is most likely being referred to in early references to the Gospel of Thomas. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas was written in the 2nd century, according to scholars, which is much later than the canonical Gospel's 1st century dates. There are a ton of fantastic tales about this time in Jesus' life in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. The following stated are miracles that Jesus is said to have accomplished are listed in the infancy gospel of Thomas. The following stated are miracles that Jesus is said to have accomplished are listed in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Bringing dried fish to life, in some later versions, bringing life to clay sparrows that Jesus had crafted on the Sabbath, cursing a boy who dies and his parents who are blinded to raising a friend who was killed by falling from a roof, knowing the character of the Jesus presented in this gospel. The parents accuse Jesus of throwing him off the roof, healing a man who cut off part of his foot while chopping wood, carrying water in a cloak after accidentally breaking the water jar. The Thomas's infancy gospel occasionally portrays Jesus as a violent, aggressive youngster. In one instance, Joseph condemns Jesus for blinding the parents of a boy he killed, saying, when Joseph realized that Jesus had done such a thing, he became upset and grabbed his ear and pulled extremely hard. It's one thing for you to seek and not find, it's quite another for you to act this foolishly, the youngster responded, growing furious with him. Don't you realize that I actually don't belong to you? Don't irritate me. This is supposed to be Jesus as a little child, not as an adolescent or young adult. In the infancy gospel of Thomas, Jesus is portrayed as an arrogant bully who abuses his power. People are amazed by his intelligence and strength but they are not moved by his goodness because they are terrified of him. After one of Jesus' miracles, no one dared to anger him for fear of being cursed and crippled for life. The infancy gospel of Thomas contradicts what we know about Jesus the person since it does not portray Jesus as someone who respects his parents or gains the goodwill of his neighbors. 5. The Book of Enoch. Along with Elijah and Jesus, Enoch is one of only three people in the Bible who are brought to heaven while still alive. Genesis 5 verse 24 states, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. See also Hebrews 11 verse 5. This verse tells us about Enoch's translation. The most common reference to the Book of Enoch is one Enoch, which is only completely preserved in the Ethiopic language. The Eritrean Orthodox Church and the Coptic Church in Ethiopia both recognize the Book of Enoch as canonical. 2 Enoch, the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, and 3 Enoch, the Hebrew Book of Enoch, follow 1 Enoch. Aramaic and Greek fragments of the Book of Enoch. There is an intense focus on angelology and demonology, and a large portion of the book is devoted to filling in the background of Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. The Book of Enoch thus explains the origin of the Nephilim and the identity of the sons of God, mentioned in Genesis 6 verse 2 and 4. As a result, the Book of Enoch is a strange and sensationalistic work of non-canonical literature. The Book of Enoch should be treated the same way as other apocryphal literature, along with similar books. The Apocrypha contains some historically accurate and truthful information, but also a lot of false data. If you read these works, you should not regard them as the inspired, perfect word of God, but rather as interesting but faulty historical texts. 6. The Book of Giants. The story of the work of giants, a pseudo-epigraphal work that is set in the antediluvian period and has Enoch and a number of giants as heroes, centers on how sinful the earth was before the flood. Islam regarded the Book of Giants as authoritative scripture, yet it is not the inspired word of God. The Book of Giants is neither a historically accurate or trustworthy book, despite its inspiration coming from the canonical book of Genesis. A Jewish pseudepigraphal book called One Enoch, which likely comes before the Book of Giants, 
as a material that is comparable to that of the Book of Giants. The Book of Giants is a genuine ancient text that was written before the 2nd century BC, as proven by the discovery of fragments of an Aramaic copy of the book among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Middle Persian, Old Turkic, Parthian, and other languages all have portions of the Book of Giants. The Nephilim from the Bible are given a fictional backstory in the Book of Giants by connecting them to Enoch, Noah's great-grandfather. The Nephilim were present on earth during those times, as well as later ones, when the sons of God married human women and fathered offspring through them, according to Genesis 6 verse 4. They were renowned heroes from the past. The Bible leaves out a lot of information regarding the Nephilim and Enoch. Therefore, there is no barrier stopping speculation, or imagination. The Nephilim were created by specific angelic creatures known as watchmen through human women, according to the Book of Giants. These offspring were giants that acted monstrously, murdering numerous people and destroying a great deal of land, sea, and plant life. The giants in the tale had disturbing visions that foreshadow the approaching famine and their own doom, and one of them, a giant by the name of Mahaway, seeks the advice of Enoch. The archangel Raphael has taken notice of the giant's sins and is about to destroy them, so Enoch warns them as well as a watcher by the name of Semihaza to turn from their sins. The giants, the Nephilim, and many demons ultimately suffer a cruel fate. The Watchers are either murdered, depending on which version of the Book of Giants is being read, or chained by four angels in a dark prison. There are several ancient texts like the Book of Giants that resemble the look and feel of biblical literature but are not accepted as canonical or genuine history. They remain for so long in part because they have stolen the gravity of the Bible. The plot of the Bible is copied in texts like the Book of Giants, and biblical people are occasionally used as actors to produce what is now classified as historical fiction. Works such as the Book of Giants are imaginative, and they may help us understand ancient cultures and languages. But if God wanted us to know more about the Nephilim and the giants that lived before the flood, he would have given us more information about them in his word. 7. The story of Bell and the Dragon Asterisk One of numerous additions to Daniel's book is Bell and the Dragon. After chapter 12, the original book of Daniel comes to an end. The extra information is absent from the Masoretic text and is only present in translations like the Septuagint. Bell and the Dragon is a later edition that was probably inspired by different Daniel legends and stories from the past. Chapter 13, titled Song of the Three Children, Chapter 14, titled Susanna, and Chapter 15, titled Bell and the Dragon, are among the non-canonical passages in this book. The fifteenth chapter is divided into three separate narratives. The new Persian king, Cyrus, honors Daniel above all others, according to the text of Bel and the Dragon. The king questions Daniel as to why he does not worship the statue of Bel, which receives daily offerings of abundant food from the people. Daniel responds that he only worships the living God and does not worship false gods created by humans. Due to the fact that every piece of food that Cyrus is given each night disappears, the idol, according to Cyrus, must be a living god. Daniel states his belief that his god is more powerful than Bel. The narrative claims that God provides for Daniel through the prophet Habakkuk. To do this, God sends an angel to lift Habakkuk from Judea over the den while holding him by the hair, allowing him to throw food to Daniel. Cyrus discovers Daniel to be well and living on the sixth day. Instead, he instructs the crowd's leaders to be thrown into the lion's den, where they are promptly eaten. The book of Daniel is inspired, but Bell and the Dragon, as a supplement to the inspired text, is not recognized part of the biblical canon. It is included in some apocryphal Bibles and in Catholic interpretations of the text. 8. Assumption of Moses a book from the first century called The Assumption of Moses claims to record prophesies that Moses told Joshua. The Testament of Moses is another name for the book. Several of the early church fathers, including Origen, made reference to its contents, but the book was not and is not regarded as a part of the biblical canon. The Assumption of Moses, unlike the Bible, is badly saved, appearing in just one Latin translated document, dating from a time after AD 500, is missing a significant amount of the text. The Assumption of Moses has considerable relevance to contemporary biblical research even though it is practically lost and obviously of a late date. Early Christians made reference to the Assumption of Moses, but it was not canonized, therefore that makes it historical. Jude's reference to Michael and Satan arguing over the body of Moses, Jude 1 verse 9, may also be a reference to a scene from the Assumption of Moses. 
Jude's tale is consistent with the classic Jewish tale, which is also discussed in the Assumption of Moses. This indicates that the first century text is not the story's original source but rather a different description of it. 9. Book of Jasher. The Book of Jasher, also known as the Book of the Upright One in the Greek Septuagint and the Book of the Just Ones in the Latin Vulgate, was most likely a compilation of ancient Hebrew songs and poems honoring Israel's warriors and their valorous achievements in combat. When the Lord blocked the sun in the middle of the day during the Battle of Beth Horon, Joshua 10 verses 12 to 13 mentions the Book of Jasher. The Song or Lament of the Bow, a sad funeral song that David wrote at the time of Saul and Jonathan's deaths, is also mentioned in 2 Samuel 1 verses 18 to 27. Why was the book of Jasher omitted from the canon of scripture, since it is mentioned in the Bible? We are aware that God inspired the writers of the scriptures to include quotations from a wide range of extra-biblical sources while creating his word. A noteworthy example is the verse reported in Joshua 10 verse 13. Joshua quoted from the book of Jasher when describing this fight, not because it was his only source for the events, rather, he was saying, in basic terms, if you don't believe what I'm saying, go read it in the book of Jasher. Even in that book, this incident is documented. Even though it was written in Hebrew, another book with the same name, often referred to as Pseudo-Jasher, is not the book of Jasher described in the Bible. It is a book of Jewish legends covering everything from creation to Joshua's conquest of Canaan, although according to experts, it was not written until AD 1625. Also known as Sefer HaYasher, there are numerous other theological writings by Jewish rabbis and academics, but none of them make the claim to be the original book of Jasher. Ultimately, we must draw the conclusion that the book of Jasher mentioned in the Bible was destroyed and has not been found in the present. The other novels with the same title are either Jewish moral treatises or simple fiction. 10. The Conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan The book of Adam and Eve, also known as The Conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan or The Contradiction of Adam and Eve, is thought to be a recorded account of what transpired in Adam and Eve's lifetimes after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. The book does not belong to the inspired Word of God but to the extra-biblical pseudepigrapha. The book of Adam and Eve is thought to have been composed by an unidentified Egyptian author who originally penned the narrative in Arabic before having it translated into Ethiopic. It is challenging to identify the exact time of the Book of Adam and Eve's original composition, but many think it was penned a few hundred years or so before the birth of Christ. The book's initial English translation was published in the 19th century. The Book of Adam and Eve is made up of two books. The events surrounding Adam and Eve's departure from Eden and following satanic temptations are told in Book I. Twin sisters were shared by Cain and Abel, according to the Book of Adam. Because of his parents' desire for him to get married to Abel's twin, Aklia, rather than his own twin, Loyua, Cain killed Abel. The conflicting families of Seth and Cain's pre-flood history is described in Book 2 of the Book of Adam and Eve. The imaginary account of Adam and Eve's life after the fall is presented in the two parts of the Book of Adam and Eve. Abel's blood caused the earth to tremble, Cain was unable to bury him because the grave kept spitting out his body, chapter 79, and Adam and Eve kept Abel's body in their cave for seven years, book 2, chapter 1, among other fantastic tales, are all present in it. With its claim both Cain and Abel brought sacrifices of blood and grain the book of Adam and Eve also demonstrates obvious conflicts with the Bible. Cain presented a bloodless sacrifice of some of the fruits of the soil, according to Genesis 4 verses 3-4, while Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Nothing in the book of Adam and Eve can genuinely be confirmed or backed up. It was never a part of Holy Scripture but is not a lost book of the Bible. The book of Adam and Eve or any other work of fiction is not our final, God-inspired authority, rather, it is the Bible. 11. The Apostles' Creed Throughout history, the Apostles' Creed is not found in the Bible. The Apostles' Creed was not written by the Apostles. Rather, it was written at least 150 years after the Apostles had all died. It is called the Apostles' Creed because it is supposed to be a record of what the Apostles taught. The Apostles' Creed is as follows. I have faith in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of the heavens and the world, and in His only Son, Jesus Christ, who is also my Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate tortured, who was crucified, who died, and who was buried. He went down to hell. He returned from the dead on the third day. 
He ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the all-powerful God, from whom he will one day come to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the saints' communion, sin forgiveness, and the power of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Christian doctrine is simply put up in the Apostles' Creed. But there are mainly two issues with the Apostles' Creed. First, about the statement, he descended into hell, the term, the Holy Catholic Church, here does not apply to the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today, which is the second point. The definition of Catholic is, universal. All those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation make up the actual, Catholic, Church. The four canonical Gospels are well known to the majority of people. There were, however, other accounts of Jesus that were told in the early Church as well as ones that were written much later. Some of these have only recently come to light. The early church rejected these writings as inspired scripture. 12. Story of Susanna. The Book of Susanna, also known as History of Susanna and the Elders, is included in the Old Testament of Catholic Bibles as one of the so-called canon slash deuterocanonical works. The intertestamental period, or around 400 years between the writing of the texts in the Old and New Testaments, is when the Apocrypha was mostly written. One of the 12 to 15 books commonly accepted to make up the Apocrypha is Susanna. The insertion of Susanna, along with Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Azariah, and the Song of the Three Jews, to the Book of Daniel most certainly occurred between 200 and 100 BC depending on the culture, the Bible's placement of the Book of Daniel, which was written in the 6th century BC by the prophet Daniel himself. Jews placed it among the writings, while English versions place it among the major prophets. According to Theodosian tradition, the book of Susanna is typically positioned before the events of Daniel 1, however, the Septuagint and Vulgate editions situated between Daniel 12 and 14. Although weirdly Susanna is not dependent on Daniel itself, the Old Testament books of Genesis, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy have the greatest literary effect. The Letter to Africanus, a comprehensive dialogue between Africanus and Origen, it is demonstrated to the dispute over whether it should be omitted from the canon even though the early church first regarded it as canonical. Although brief, the book of Susanna is a powerful book about innocence and how man has defied God's law. Even though most Jews and Christians regard it as fiction, it is nevertheless worthy of study and application to modern Judaism and Christianity since it is a story with a lesson that applies to everyday life. Readers of Susanna may gain a deeper understanding of the positive and negative aspects of man's interpretation of God's law as well as the assurance that, no matter what, God will make sure that justice rules by examining its key principles and Jewish philosophy at the time it was written. 13. Book of Jubilees the Book of Jubilees, also referred to as the Lesser Genesis, or the Testament of Moses, is a pseudepigraphal work of Jewish apocalyptic writing. It was most likely composed between 135 and 105 years ago, in the 2nd century BC. The history of the Bible, as told to Moses by an angel on Mount Sinai, is told in the Book of Jubilees. It extends from the world's beginning through Moses' time. The history is divided into 49-year jubilees in this book. The book of jubilees generally comes after the names of Adam's daughters and the formation of angels are among the noteworthy elements that are added into the tale of creation as it is described in the book of Genesis. According to some academics, the book of jubilees is a long-form midrash on Genesis through the first half of Exodus. An Ethiopic manuscript from the 6th century AD contains the only full copy of the book of jubilees that is currently alive. There are 1,307 verses in it. Most scholars believe that the text was initially written in either Hebrew or Aramaic. The finding of Hebrew writings with portions of the Book of Jubilees in the Dead Sea Scrolls give support to this view. At least 15 different copies of the Book of Jubilees have been found at Qumran so far. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Jubilees, Van der Kam, J., and Morgan, S., the Missouri Review, the College of Arts and Science of the University of Missouri, December 1, 1992, all have been reduced to fragments, and those pieces only make up around 3% of the book's overall content. Additionally, there are some Jubilees fragments still existing in Greek and Latin, but neither language has a complete copy of the work. Some scholars have noted that Jubilees seems to have been written specifically to further the author's commitment to a solar-based calendar. God is concerned that his people would be disturbed all their seasons and the years will be dislocated, 
and they will neglect their laws, Jubilees 633, when he speaks to them in the book of Jubilees. The sun does indeed follow a more regular timetable than the moon. So, in Jubilees, God established the 364-day solar calendar to avoid confusion and preserve holy days from becoming dislodged. Since 7 is a factor of 364, the same date falls on the same day of the week every year under that system, for example, July 4th would fall on the same day of the week every year. In conclusion, the Book of Jubilees contributes to the Mosaic Law but lacks sufficient manuscript proof, responds toward hagiography, provides religious ideas about the calendar. Jubilees falls short of the requirements of the canon of Scripture for each of these reasons. 14. The Epistle of Jeremiah One of the apocryphal books is the Letter of Jeremiah, also known as the Epistle of Jeremy. Although it occasionally stands alone in some forms, it is frequently included as chapter 6 of the Book of Baruch. Books that are generally not regarded as inspired are apocryphal. Apocrypha is Greek for, things hidden away. These works were never accepted into the Hebrew canon, Jesus or the Apostles did not recognize them as canonical, and early Jewish writers did not recognize them as scripture. A lot of these works also have chronological, topographical, or historical errors. Some denominations refer to them as deuterocanonical, or as a component of the secondary canon. One of the letter of Jeremiah's earliest manuscripts was discovered among the Qumran scrolls, and it is written in Greek. The majority of academics, however, think that the original text may have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Most scholars agree that it was written between 307 and 317 BC. The later date is supported by the fact that most of the content seems to be reliant on certain Isaiah passages in the Bible. Despite being referred to as the letter of Jeremiah, the text is neither a letter nor is it from Jeremiah. Writing took occurred over 300 years after Jeremiah was commissioned to prophesy. The majority of the text consists of criticisms of worship. It starts off with a warning to the refugees about the idolatry they will encounter in Babylon, and then proceeds to give a number of moving examples of how useless and powerless idols are. It ends with a last warning and advice to stay away from idolatry. This book, like all apocryphal works, cannot be regarded as the inspired word of God. This does not imply that the book is bad, though, a lot of the information is accurate and beneficial. It might contain helpful advice, even godly advice, but it cannot be regarded as perfect. Why don't you check out this videos that I suggested you might really like. While before leaving the channel hit that subscribe button and become part of the Shining family.